Uh, as Janko mentioned, usually I'm giving talks on, let's say, goat cognition or goat behavior. Um, uh, only until recently, uh, I was asked whether I might talk about a different topic. And what came to mind was, um, especially during these times, um, that I could talk about how to promote your academic work and how to do this online and how to increase the visibility of your academic work online. So, of course, you've been already familiar with the situation. Uh, so most of the conferences, seminar series, workshops, you can list whatever you want, have been cancelled or postponed. Uh, some of them go virtual, which is an actual nice development on this as well. But most of them have been cancelled. Um, and so people have less opportunity to showcase the work, which is particularly relevant, not only, but particularly relevant for, I think, PhD students and early postdocs who do not have a well-established and elaborated network of peers yet. So an alternative way, not only during this time, but uh, in general would be to showcase your work online or to increase the visibility of your work online. Um, in my personal opinion, there are three um, motivations to do this. Uh, one is from an academic perspective and uh, by, for example, having your own web page, uh, making you more prominent online, um, being more active in the general discussion on new discoveries and new science can give you a competitive edge compared to uh, your your other applicants for a job or for a grant, for example. We all know that academia is increasing or is getting more and more competitive. So having this little competitive edge might give you something out at the end. And it also helps you to establish your own brand. And with brand, I'm, I mean your, your, your specific academic niche that you usually have to find and that you have to promote to your peers. But I think there's also a personal perspective. Uh, when we think about how uh, uh, a project starts, we collect data for months or even years, we write it together, uh, we, we analyze the data. So from the start of a project or from the start of data collection to the final publication of the paper, it can take months or years. And uh, let's say we would aim to publish this in a, in a specific relatively small journal. Um, we don't have money to pay the open access fees, uh, so it will be paywalled uh, in a relatively small journal, which, and this is just my estimation, uh, might end up in, let's say, 50 or 100 downloads or 50 or 100 people actually having access to your paper over the journal page and uh, being able to, um, uh, to, to to, to pay the fees for getting rid of the paywall or have a university subscription uh, for this journal. Um, so in my opinion, 50 to 100 downloads or 50 to 100 readers is quite a lot, but specifically when we look that this includes work from, from several months or years, I think you, we should pay way more attention or we give it way more attention uh, we should give this paper or these paper publications way more attention and the attention that they deserve. But though there's also the societal perspective. Um, most of the funding we receive uh, is uh, from taxpayers. So I think, again, my personal perspective on this, it's, a, it's for us, it's a moral obligation to make our research also accessible to the public, not only to, to our colleagues and peers, but also to society in general. And we can do this again by increasing the visibility uh, online or, or in real life as well. So I structured the talk in, in three sub chapters, you might say, or sub parts. Uh, the first one specifically deals with how to promote your research, like you, how, what can you do to make your publications or your conference presentations more visible. Um, the second one is how to promote yourself, and I, with that I mean how to promote your, your um, academic identity uh, and you as a researcher. And of course there's some uh, severe overlap between those two. And the third one, and I try to be really brief on that, is a more generic one, and it's like how to stay proactive, how, how is it possible to, next to doing all the stuff we do as researchers, also dealing with all these 
um, proactive um, the measures that we can take to increase the visibility of our work. Um, so my three main recommendations for making your research more visible in general would be that whenever you have the option to do this, go open access. Whenever you have the option to do this, preprint your research as well. And whenever you have the option to do this, do outreach about your research. That includes press releases, writing blogs and similar things. So uh, I think most of you are already familiar with uh, open access and how this usually works. Um, the most prominent uh, open access option is the gold open access option. And that means that you publish in uh, open access journals or you make the, the article at least open access to a wider uh, to a wider audience. This usually includes uh, article processing fees, which can be depending on the journal again, quite expensive. I put a small link in here where you can find a list of journals that do not require open processing fees or have relatively small amounts of open processing fees uh, and journals that also serve uh, animal behavior or zoology audiences. Um, so when you choose the gold open access way, uh, you can either do this in full open access journals. Um, my personal opinion would be that I would recommend this compared to the second option, which would be to publish in hybrid journals. With hybrid journals, I mean, as an example, uh, applied animal behavior science, um, where you usually have your, your library paying a subscription to get access to the papers that have been published in there. And if you want to have your paper open access in this journal, you have to pay a relatively high open uh, article processing fee on top of these already paid subscriptions. So what you do in hybrid journals, usually you pay uh, you pay the, the publishers and we all are familiar with the discussion on their publishing uh, models and the, the how it might be not that ethical, how they um, distribute scientific results and scientific findings. Um, my personal recommendation would be to not publish open access and hybrid journals, but this is up to everyone uh, and this is everyone's own choice. Um, a second way which might not be as prominent as gold open access publishing is the green way. The green way basically refers to self archiving your publications. This does not require any article processing fees, so basically everyone can do this. And this does not only apply to your current publications, so the paper that comes out in one or two months, but also applies to publications that have been um, that that you have published five years ago, where you thought, well, I, I don't have the, I, I did not have the money five years ago to pay gold open access, but you can now put them um, open access as well with the, via the Greenway. Uh, there's a link below to the Sherpa Romeo uh, database, and this Sherpa Romeo database gives you a lot of information on how specific journals deal with this green open access way. Here again, I choose the example of applied animal behavior science. So you see here that it's a Romeo Green journal, and also that paid open access option is available for this journal. Though this means uh, it's it's a hybrid journal where you can additionally pay open access fees to make it gold open access. Um, so what you can see here is a lot of information how the journal allows or does not allow that the articles are being distributed. What you cannot do uh, with their journals, uh, with their publications, is that you cannot, as an author, archive the publisher's version, version of the PDF. So that means a fully formatted actual publication or journal article. But what you can do is you can take the postprint, which is uh, the final draft uh, post refereeing, as I mentioned here. So the, the, final sub, uh, the final manuscript that you send to the journal, uh, which has then been accepted. So it's basically all the content of your article, but without the fancy formatting and layout of the journal. And you can put this, uh, you can find more clar clarifications here on the postprint. Uh, you can put this postprint on your personal web page immediately. So you do not have to wait. You can just put this on your web page and people will have access to it and can access your article. You can also put this on specific open access repositories. 
Uh, some universities have their own repositories. There are other more open and broader repositories when you can, where you can put this as well after an embargo period of 12 months. And these 12 months can differ depending on the journal you're publishing in. So some have no embargo, some have six, some have 12, some have 24 months. Um, so this is basically the green way. Your post print on your personal web page or on a repository, which can be accessed by everyone who is looking for your paper. There's also another way uh, that they state here, and this is uh, the author's preprint. That means that before your article goes into peer review uh, and into print, of course, uh, you can also um, put this on si uh, online. Uh, and here you see authors can preprint on any website, including Archive and Repack. Uh, these are two specific uh, preprint servers where you can publish this. So this journal allows preprints. Um, in general, um, just a brief uh, description what preprints refer to. Um, preprints are, are basically non-peer-reviewed articles uh, and manuscripts that you can submit to a preprint servers such as OSF preprints or BioArchive um, before or when you submit your paper to a journal. So your paper will be available already. Uh, to your colleagues, uh, to to society in general, but has not been peer reviewed yet. There's a lot of controversy on this in general, but specifically now with all the Corona stuff going on, that there um, that that it it sometimes appears to be hard that scientists, but also um, journalists and and other people, have problems to distinguish between proper peer reviewed science and uh, manuscripts that have been only submitted to preprint servers. So what are your advantages that you can get from posting a preprint? Um, you get early feedback. You can, for example, email uh, this preprint to your peers, to your colleagues, um, uh, share it on social media or, or via your homepage or whatever channels you're using. So you can get feedback on the article, not only from the two or three reviewers of the journal, which might be in a in a in a hurry and do not spot some flaws that might be in there. So peer review does not equal always really good quality control. So um, you can get more feedback on your articles um, because your manuscripts and the content of your manuscript and the data that you have there is already uh, online. So people are aware of that. So um, you get automatically a higher citation count count compared to if you would not put this preprint online and just would have the published article at the end. So your article at the end will have a higher citation count in on average than articles that have not been preprinted. And of course, with the information provided in your preprints, you will have a wider dissemination at a very early stage, um, which might be quite relevant if you know that there might be uh, if you, for example, fear scooping uh, your results or that somebody published on a topic that, that you are working on, having a preprint is basically putting a timestamp on your final manuscript with your claims of uh, that includes the claims that you can make from the data that you got from your experiments. Uh, again, I put some links here to the two uh, uh, repositories, so you might check those out as well. But there's also, I think, an um, an ethical or, or welfare aspect when we talk about preprints. When you submit a paper to peer review, this might take months or even years. And at some point, people, if they get several rejections, might think of not publishing the paper at all because it's it's too much of their it takes too much work out of their schedule that is already quite uh, full. So there might be papers that uh, went to the, the file drawer uh, and are never actually published. And this might also be the case, especially for, for negative findings that are have a lower chance of getting published at all. So by putting your articles, your manuscripts, once they're ready on preprint servers, you can make others, specifically your colleagues and people that work in the same uh, area like you, you can uh, give them access to your test protocol and to your data. So others can basically check uh, how you have run your study, if they want to do something similar or want to build up on this topic as well. Uh, and 
by doing this and sharing these resources, I think it's this is a good way to maximize the resources in general that we have. Um, so we do not run studies uh, or two labs do not necessarily run a similar study and making the same flaws or errors in that. So you can learn from the preprints of another and do not have to wait until the article is published. And this might also lead to better implementation of the three hours. If you do not have to run or if, if two labs do not run the same study, um, they might um, uh, they might uh, reduce in general or on average the number of animals that they're using for their studies because they do not basically uh, not a redundant study, but do not run a similar experiment that a preprint basically or another lab has been proven to not work. Um, once you have published your article uh, or you put out your preprint, whatever you prefer, um, I already mentioned that most of our research is publicly supported through Texas. So I think that once your findings are out, it's imperative to make them accessible to the public. And you can do this by press releases uh, or by doing general outreach and contacting journals, uh, newspapers or magazines. Uh, and you can either end up targeting a really general audience, like having a newspaper article like the left one or the right one, which is for don't ask me how I ended up there, but it's a dog magazine in Germany. So uh, this is an interview with a, with a dog magazine. So you can reach a target audience that might have, probably has never heard about your research uh, and you might uh, provide them with some information uh, and you can get, you can give the public something of that uh, taxpayer money funded research that you're doing back and provide them uh, with the value that you, your research basically adds to society. Um, so my recommendations would be that if you have some interesting findings that you're going to publish, try to file a press release for that. Uh, even if you started a new exciting project, uh, and this goes in the similar direction like the preprints, file a press release because other labs in the world might think about running a similar project. And once they see that you're doing this, you might get in contact with them. You might start a bigger collaboration that makes your research in general better and might improve the reliability and robustness of your research at the end. If you aren't allowed or if you cannot do uh, a press release because some institutions uh, have limited resources or do not, for example, do press releases for uh, starting projects or for theoretical papers, you can still write a blog post about your publication or your project. Um, but you might think I, I can I can surely write something small and very um, uh, something something for a general audience about the new project or about these publications. But who's going to publish this? Where do I submit this? Where can I put this online? Well, there are uh, several uh, repositories or, or outlets here as well. Uh, I just named three of them. Medium gained quite some attention uh, during the Corona times, so a lot of people were using Medium as something like a well let's say a, a a facebook for blog entries um but also the other two uh conversation and eon are are kind of a hybrid between uh, a newsletter or a newspaper and uh, blog entries so uh, what you can do is you can you can um, get in contact with them or you just set up an account with Medium and you can block or, or set your block in there or your, your text about your research there. Um, I will come back to this later. There's also a, an, a, still an alternative to this. You can, of course, have your own block uh, on your own web page. But again, I will come to this in a few minutes. Um, what I think is also important when you aim to improve your outreach and your aim is to do this efficiently and effectively, um, I would recommend to check your impact and uh, with impact you mean your 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 outreach impact, your outreach activities and how often they are shared and reported and uh, brought to, to the general public's attention via newsletters or blogs. And you're probably very familiar with that button here. This is a metric button which can be quite colorful. Each color represents a different medium where some article was shared. and. Uh, this gives you a nice and comprehensive overview about uh, how often your article has been put into a newspaper or has been covered by a blog post uh, or somebody tweeted about that. Um, and of course, the higher that number, 
um, the more people have access or will look at your article. So this means the higher that number, you will also have an increase of downloads and the more people that download your article, the more people that, that get in contact with your with the content of the article, uh, you will also have higher chances that your uh, that this affects your citation count of this specific article. Um, you might now think, well, I have I have a bunch of articles published. Um, I do not have the time to check all of them and see how they perform on this measure. And uh, thanks to some other platforms, for example, Kudos or Publons, uh, with the links provided here, you can have a very easy way where you uh, have basically listed all your publications and you have the metric score on them uh, instantly and next to them. So you can compare performances and see which press release might uh, has been worked pro um, probably quite well or which outreach strategy brought the most attention to your articles. Um, the second point I want to discuss is, and as I mentioned, this might overlap quite a lot with the, with the first part, is how to make yourself as a researcher and your academic niche more visible. Um, the three points I have here are, are that you should definitely create your own homepage. Um, if you think you, or if you, if you, if you assume that you do not have time to that, uh, to to create it and to create it, you should still create your Google Scholar and OCAD accounts. I will come back to the advantages and benefits later, and you might consider using social media. So this is a, a screenshot from my personal web page. Uh, you see here that uh, you can include a lot of different information on this web page from a quick summary of your research to a news section, uh, your own personal blog section. You have your CV there, uh, publication list, talks, posters, media and press coverage and stuff like that. And the, the nice thing of having your own web page is, and this is again specifically relevant for, for junior researchers who might change affiliation it's after some years, um, that you do not have to uh, rely on your institutional homepage. Uh, you have all your information on the same space, independent where you go in terms of, or independent uh, where, where your next move is and which affiliation will host you in the next years. You will always have this home page and people can still rely on all the information from that home page. Uh, and in addition, and this happened quite often in my personal experience, when you, for example, looking up uh, researchers that you met at a conference or we just saw a nice, a nice new publication on that, you might look them up and what you find is an institutional home page of that researcher, which might provide the email address, the name, and if you're lucky, a picture of them. So we can actually see whether this is the same person but often they lack a lot of information like the background, what they're studying, the publication list and some other resources. And of course, this is surely due to a lack of resources at the institution, but with a personal homepage, you can prevent this and you can put all the information about you and your research on, uh, uh, on, a, on, uh, on a space that will stay and that, will, uh, that you can curate and update whenever you want. And you might wonder, well, of course, I can do my own homepage, um, but who should be interested in all of that? Um, so I created my homepage five years ago, or about five years ago, and the first number is the views that they got, and the second is the number of unique visitors. So over five years, almost 9,000 people or unique visitors uh, looked into this homepage, which is um, I, I do not really can I can't really compare it with other blogs. I do not know the numbers of those, but just having nine thousand people seeing the research that I'm doing, I think is quite a good thing uh, compared to the time I usually invest in updating the homepage. This is a, a more specific look on that. What you see is the the different unique visitors for for the homepage, and you see, of course, most of them go on the start page and probably leave and are not interested or just think it's not relevant for them. But there are also a lot of unique visitors to uh, these three that follow up here, and these three are uh, individual blog posts that I put on my homepage as well. Um, so remember when I said that you depending on a journal you're publishing, you might end up with 50 or 100 downloads or not a lot of people that actually have access to the content or the idea behind your paper. Um, if you uh, 
uh, write a blog post and share it a bit on social media or let others share it on social media and other and other mediums and other resources, you might end up with 1,000 or 2,000 individual visitors that actually read about your research, that know what you are doing, and that might or might not attribute value or extra value to the work you are doing. So you are able to increase the number of people that you can that you can uh, target with your publication a lot by writing blog posts and also by putting those on your own web page. So your personal web page can highlight your specific academic niche, and I think this is really important. Again, going back to this competitive edge that you can get uh, or that you want to have in order to uh, compete with other people uh, for jobs and grants and funding in general. You can self archive your publications so you can on your own personal web page put all your publications uh, with a green open access label uh, and as a post print online so people will have access to this even if it's usually behind a paywall. You will have your permanent digital CV and you can also include blog posts on that. So I think this these are four really strong points for, for doing this and for creating your own homepage. These are four resources that I think might be quite useful for this. Uh, you can also do your own homepage via our block down for, for those who are really familiar with the R environment and would like to do this in this way. Otherwise, uh, WordPress, Yahoo and Wix are some uh, three platforms that are easy to manage and have a nice uh, graphic user interface for that. Well, after all of this, you might think, well, I consider doing a homepage. This looks quite easy, but actually I have no idea how to structure that. I have no idea what a content I should put on there. And if I look at my schedule, I, I do not really have time to do this either. So there's still two things that I would recommend everyone to do in order to have something like a public or a CV online and a uh, publication list online and these two easy steps are creating your account with Google Scholar and ORCID. Google Scholar, uh, most of you probably are familiar with that. Um, on the Google Sp Scholar profile you can see all your publications uh, including their citations and those are automatically updated so Google is basically checking the web all the time whether you have a new publication or not and notifies you if they find a new paper. You will have all the key information to these papers and your profile on this page uh, with a citation count, uh, your age index, some funding agencies might think this is a relevant information, for example. So we'll have a digital publish that needs very little time to create and to manage and which will be accessible to everyone. Um, Orchid on the other side, um, has also the option to have a digital publish for you, um, but also offers a digital full CV, which is quite relevant for funding agencies as well. Um, most importantly, ORCID gives you a unique identifier. Think about um, researchers that might have a name that is quite common in their country or the region. Uh, so if you see a paper, you cannot be sure, or specifically when you see an older paper, you cannot be sure whether this person uh, is the same person you just try to Google or you just uh, or found on, on a different article on a different topic as well. Uh, and with ORCID, what you can do, you can link your publications or your posters with this ORCID account. So you might have noticed that on some papers, there's a small green ORCID button behind the author's name and clicking this brings you automatically to this unique digital full CV of the author. So, um, and again here for junior researchers, who might change affiliation. This, come also, this comes also in handy because uh, they can still be contacted, uh, contacted and people see where they're working now and can uh, have the, the updated email address and all that things. So um, it might, it, it improves um, the way and it eases up the way how you can follow up on the research of people and how you can uh, probably get in contact with those people. Uh, the third point, uh, is about social media and Facebook is I think quite a nice way to promote your research specifically if you want to target a, a, a general audience. Instagram is a, is a cool medium where you can 
uh, graphically show how life as a researcher actually is, what how the schedule of a researcher looks like, because I think lots of people outside of academia have certain stereotypes uh, referring or concerning researchers like the biologists are always out in the in the jungle and uh, collecting primate poo or something like that, but do not really see or do not really know that a lot of the work that we're doing is behind the desk and is uh, actually analyzing the data and writing, writing, writing. So Instagram is a nice platform to counter this narrative and to, pro, uh, to give a um, to give a, an argument against those stereotypes that might be out there. But as Janko already mentioned, uh, I personally think that nothing tops Twitter when it comes to social media for social, uh, for, for, for scientists. Uh, and there are several reasons I think Twitter, but social media in general, is, is extremely useful and not only for promoting your work. Uh, the first point is that you will get a lot of information out of this. You will see papers uh, from your colleagues that have been accepted, that have not been published yet, so you have a a head start in terms of the information that is out there. You might get information about the newest preprints. You get new job adverts or grant opportunities. You might um, uh, improve your networking or you extend your network with that. Uh, I put hashtag conference behind this because he, at most of the conferences, people try to uh, create a hashtag for this conference so people who cannot attend the conference can follow from home and these people might not attend because they do not have the money they did not have something they could present um, and by following those people that actually attend the conference they get uh, the impression that they are part of it so it can extend the the you i think you can better connect the global community especially when it comes to sharing research at conferences and uh, having this this feeling of being one big community uh, instead of being uh, just groups or small groups of people that can afford to go to every conference that is available worldwide. And one very important point I think is, and again here I specifically want to refer to junior researchers, is a kind of shared experience that you will have on this. So example, for example, you're in a small affiliate or in a small lab, you have not a lot of colleagues at your stage, uh, you might get a rejection for a latest paper. You submitted a small grant, you got rejected, and you might easily get the impression that you're not sufficient for the system, that you're not good enough for the system. But rejections are uh, a fundamental part of academic life in general. So we all get rejections. Uh, we all get rejections for papers and grants and stuff like that. And people share that on social networks as well. So when you're on Twitter, you see a lot of information of people who have received rejections, uh, high ranking, really high impact people that got rejected in the latest grant. Um, well, this gives you an impression that that it's part of the system, that it's not you, but it's it's uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's it's systematic for the academic field that these rejections appear. Um, and it also gives you a lot of information on how to deal with that, like you submitted a grant which got rejected, you will find new resources where you can submit a, a similar version of that grant and so on. And uh, you also get, uh, and this is a really nice part of Twitter as well, you will get a lot of support and comfort if something like rejection happened to you. So people will encourage you to submit it again uh, and you might also extend your network in that way by this shared experience. But of course, you can also use this platform to advertise your work. Um, I just try to briefly illustrate this with this example here. So we published a, a review on farm animal cognition last year. Uh, I put a small a Twitter thread together on this. Uh, and you see this got retweeted 170 times. For those of you who are not on Twitter, uh, and even those who are on Twitter, you might have no idea what this actually means or how much impact this has and what the actually what, what happened with this article if it's retweeted 170 times. Um, but luckily, uh, Twitter provides a lot of analytics to your activities on the platform. So when you look here, this is impression. So how many people for, for a brief second or even for longer have seen this tweet if they have reacted to it or just scrolled through, doesn't matter. More than 40,000 people have in some way seen this tweet. 
900 of them have interacted with it and out of these 900, um, almost 300 people have clicked the link to the paper. So with one tweet that is shared quite, uh, uh, that has been shared 170 times, you can bring almost 300 people to your, uh, to your just published article, which I think, uh, and again, looking at the time that you usually spend drafting these tweets, uh, is an extremely good outcome in terms of uh, making your research visible and trying to attract uh, a larger audience to your articles. Uh, there are a lot of um, extra information on this or, or a lot of best practice and how to guides. Uh, I just illustrated two of them here and there's also uh, again a list of resources that you can click in the PDFs. Um, which I found particularly useful, especially if you're starting on Twitter and if you uh, if you have not set up an account yet. So there's a step by step guides on how to uh, get engaged with the platform. So the third point, and I try to make this really brief, uh, is uh, to do all of this or parts of that. You need to be proactive. You, you need to create your homepage, need to post something actively on Twitter. You need to engage in discussions on social networks and something like that. So for that, you in general need to be organized. You need to initiate and you need to be bold. Again, this is kind of a no brainer. And uh, I try to provide some links and resources on how to improve this or how to how to make this easier for people. Um, what I usually experience is that uh, you can only be proactive if you're not chased by your task. So if you're not just trying to tick off every single item uh, without having any prioritization on your to-do list, uh, what you need to do is you have to confirm and decline invitations strategically. So if it's for a grant review, if it's for a paper review, if it's for a collaboration, uh, you need to look weeks and months in advance to uh, to to. Um, actually get your schedule intact and have your schedule intact, intact and overload it. Uh, and of course you need to stay on top of your most important research, which is, which is, which is time. And to do this, uh, what helped me a lot was uh, having several different ways of having progress charts. So you see a quick example below here. So uh, you can do this for your talks, conference presentations, reviews as well. This gives you um, by, by Adding to this bar when you worked on this gives you a feeling of gratification that you have made progress on this and you can always after one or two weeks check back and see how much progress you've already done. And it's also a good reminder on how many tasks or current tasks are already on your desk right now. There are a lot of apps and tools that can help you manage your short and long term to do list. I just mentioned three of them here, which I found particularly useful for that. Um, and you might give them a try as well. Uh, but of course, uh, pen and paper is fine as well, but I personally find it way more uh, convenient to use in uh, a digital app because you're way more flexible in rescheduling your, your events and adding extra information or, or web links to these uh, notifications and to these entries. And of course, you need to initiate. What I learned over the last years is that you should never expect that others solve the problems that you have or that others do the things that you wish you want to have at your institute or in your society or uh, in your region. So if you want to have a journal club, launch a journal club. Uh, if you want to have a workshop on a specific topic, be the first to organize this workshop or provide a webinar on the topic. Right now, a webinar might be the better idea for that. Uh, but also, um, if you have the option to do this, take over worlds and scientific societies. This not always, uh, also, this not only will extend your network uh, and your field, but it will also help you in shaping the infrastructure and the communication within these societies, uh, and which might help you ultimately to be able to initiate more things in your field. And again, a no-brainer: be bold. Sign up for public talks. Uh, two of them I, I mentioned here: Skype a Scientist, which is an extremely in, um, terrific platform in sharing your research with school classes, and currently also with people that are putting themselves in self isolation. So you can Skype into classes, classes or families, 
uh, and talk about research. Uh, similar scheme is Pint of Science. I think they are also, also moving to virtual Pint of Science events right now, where you can present your research that you're doing to a general audience and can interact with this audience as well. And of course, if you have a talk ready, uh, contact seminar hosts uh, or contact colleagues from different departments if they have an empty slot in your seminar uh, and basically guess what how I ended up doing this talk right now. So um, especially during these times with the Corona arrivals going around and have lots of people not being at the university and lots of conferences and workshops being cancelled. Uh, I think there's also a huge demand on uh, on um, getting in research from different fields, from different departments, from different labs. So never hesitate if you already have your talk ready or almost ready to contact people whether you can present your research there. And of course, I promised goats and I deliver goats, even just a small gift on that. Uh, don't forget to post animal gifts on Twitter. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take questions and comments on the slides. Thank you. <laughs>